We're here with uh, Jim Eugenio. He's the publisher and editor of kennedysandking.com and the author of The JFK Assassination, The Evidence Today, which has a foreword by Oliver Stone. Uh, welcome, Jim. Thanks for talking to us. Sure, Dave. Nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, so what we've got is a 1968 interview with uh, researcher Harold Weisberg, and I had this digitized from the Pacifica Radio Archive, and in it, Weisberg talks about his book, Oswald in New Orleans, A Case for Conspiracy with the CIA. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Weisberg himself and what his relationship was with, with Jim Garrison? Well, Weisberg, of course, was one of the uh, earliest critics of the Warren Commission volumes. He came from an investigatory background as he used to work as a Senate investigator, all right? Uh, then he got into a little hot water during the McCarthy area, during the McCarthy era, like a lot of, a lot of kind of liberal people did. All right. And he became a farmer in Frederick, Maryland, and he got very interested in the JFK case. All right. And he wrote, oh my God, if, if you, if you counted all of his published books, plus his unpublished books, which are available at the Hood College Archive, I really believe that nobody ever wrote as many books on the JFK case as Harold Weisberg did. And to be perfectly frank, I really don't even think it's close. All right, I, I would be willing to wager that between the published and unpublished manuscripts, he probably wrote over 20 books on the John F. Kennedy assassination. Now, at the, at the time of this interview with Pacifica, Harold was in the New Orleans area and he was working on a book which ended up being called Oswald in New Orleans, Case for Conspiracy with the CIA. And at this time, he's working with New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison. It's really, uh, it, this interview is very interesting, not just because of the data information that's exchanged, but also because of how warmly Harold talks about Jim Garrison. As Because as we all know, anybody interested in the JFK case, this is going to change radically years later when Oliver Stone's film uh, JFK came out. Harold Weisberg became a staunch critic of both Oliver Stone and the film, okay, which was, of course, built around Jim Garrison's book on the Trail of the Assassins, and he was played by Kevin Costner, all right? So this is very interesting. Um, this, is, this interview took place before the trial of Clay Shaw, which, of course, ended up being a failure and then uh, Garrison could not get the perjury charges that he wanted, okay, on, on Shaw. And then that more or less stopped his inquiry, all right? But at this time in 1968, uh, it's very striking that a lot of the things that Harold is saying in this interview were pretty much the same things that Jim Garrison was saying about, if you take a look back, for instance, at his Playboy interview, all right, you know, it's, a, it's very similar data. For, for instance, he talks about the false Oswald, sometimes called the second Oswald. He talks about these impersonations, all right, which of course are a very salient part of the case, all right. Then he talks about Guy Bannister, and the fact that the CRC, the Cuban Revolutionary Council, is in the same building as Guy Bannister's office was the famous 544 Camp Street. Now, obviously, Harold had been there, and the, the building was not raised, I believe, until a few years later, all right? Um, but Harold says that Bannister's office, he actually says was only a, several, a few inches away. 
Now, obviously, that's kind of an exaggeration. You know, I think he meant to say a few feet away. OK, you know, I couldn't be just a few inches. But, you know, he, he obviously was at the building. And this is what he says. Now, he, like myself and Jim Garrison, makes Sergio Arcacha Smith a central character in his discoveries. And I firmly believe that. And in my, uh, my book, the second edition of Destiny Betrayed, I talk about Sergio Arcacha Smith a lot because I believe, as evidently Harold believed also, Sergio Arcacha Smith connects to both Guy Bannister and to David Ferry, all right? All right, now, uh, he also says that the alternate address, okay, uh, the 531 Lafayette address, all right, he says he found out that the mail came to one place. There was not two wall entries. Okay, they, they, so in other words, it was simply used, and he talks about it here. They would, the FBI would use the 531 Lafayette address as a diversion from saying it was a 544 Camp Street because they obviously understood that in the Warren Commission volumes, I believe in volume 25 or 26, there is the leaflet that Oswald was passing out in New Orleans that summer, which had 544 Camp Street stamped on it, all right? Now, make no mistake, Harold doesn't mention it here, but Bannister was aware of this. He was aware that Oswald stamped that address on that flyer, and he was very upset about it, okay? All right, uh, you know, he said words of the effect, how's it gonna look, okay? You know, with, uh, with my address stamped on Oswald's flyer. Well, of course, he need not worry about it because the FBI was gonna cover it up for him, okay? All right, now, Another thing that Harold talks about here, and again, I kind of agree with him on this. It's very hard to believe that Wesley Liebler and Albert Jenner of the Warren Commission were not aware of all this stuff, all right? Uh, because he says that in looking through the FBI reports, it's very clear that Ferry wrote one of the FBI reports, okay? All right, and so that should have tipped him off right there that something is really wrong here. And then from there, it was been very easy to use the, the FBI records to find out that, that uh, Sergio Arcacha Smith's office was at the 544 Camp Street address. And they obviously had the flyer because that ends up being in the volumes. And that would have led to Guy Bannister. But as he points out, there was clearly an FBI cover up about Guy Bannister because he says in the interview that the FBI report on Guy Bannister was something like 37 words long. Okay, you know, that that, that, that was it. You know, they were clearly not gonna go there, but. You, you, have to, you have to really wonder, didn't Liebler ever think that, hey, isn't this kind of funny? Why is the FBI using this 535 Lafayette address? Why are they letting Guy Bannister get away with a 37-word report? Okay. Uh, is, there, is there something deeper going on here? Okay, and then of course he brings up the other very salient point. There was no fair play for Cuba committee in, in New Orleans. You know, I mean, to say there was a fair play for Cuba committee in New Orleans is, is a joke. It's a charade. It's meant to cover up the fact, you know, that Oswald was the only guy involved in the whole thing. There was nobody else. Now, now what Harold doesn't realize here but was later brought out by people like John Newman 
is that when Oswald gets to New Orleans that summer, there's two phases to his anti-fair play for Cuba committee activities. There's one phase which goes from about uh, May and June and July in which Oswald is essentially undercover and he's passing out flyers at places like Tulane University, okay? And what he's trying to do there is snuff out any Castro sympathizers, okay, that might be in the city. And believe me, there weren't many, okay? But he's, that's what he's trying to do. But in going to a university, of course, would be one place to do it. Then after he does the undercover stuff, he breaks out when he goes over, and Harold mentions this, he goes over to Carlos Bringier's shop. Okay, all right. And he makes like he wants to help them. All right. And what, of course, in this ends up culminating in the famous fist fight on Canal Street between Bringier and Oswald, which, as he mentions here, and I agree with him wholeheartedly, is very likely a staged event. Okay, it, it was meant to attract attention to itself, all right? And therefore, now the giveaway here, and I think I think Harold mentions this in the interview, is that even though Bringier did the provoking, even though he's a guy who threw a punch at Oswald, he gets off scot-free and Oswald goes to, goes to jail and, uh, ends up paying a fine. The capper, of course, is, and again, Harold mentions it here, when Oswald goes to jail, he calls the FBI. What, <laughs> what, what kind of a communist, what kind of a real communist, once he's detained in jail, calls the FBI? You know, and, and I would I would have to say that I kind of think that's a dead giveaway, you know, and and by the way, Harold didn't know this, but the guy that Oswald requested was Warren DeBreeze, but Warren DeBreeze wasn't working that night, all right, and when William Walter, who was an employee, in, uh, an office employee of the FBI, went to look if there was a file for Oswald. He said there was a file for Oswald and it was under Debris' name, Warren Debris' name. Warren Debris was the FBI guy on the beat with the anti-Castro Cubans in New Orleans, okay? Because he spoke fluent Spanish, all right? Now, not only does, does the FBI send over an agent, but from my understanding, the interview lasted a long time. Uh, well, well over an hour. All right. Now, the host of the program, O'Connell, tries to challenge Harold as to what were the connections between what Garrison was digging up in New Orleans and what ultimately happened in Dallas. And Harold brings up the Sylvia Odio incident as one connection, which is, is good. I mean, because uh, those guys who visited Odeo with either an Oswald lookalike or Oswald himself, they said they had come from New Orleans, all right? So that would be one connection. But obviously there's, a, the, uh, there's also the fact that, and Harold didn't bring this up, there's also the fact that David Ferry drove to Texas on the day of the assassination, all right, into Houston and Galveston. And his excuse was that he wanted to go duck hunting and uh, ice skating, except that he didn't bring any shotguns and he didn't lace on a skate, okay, while he was at the arena. And the guy there who ran the place said, 
fairy stood by a phone for about an hour and a half. Okay, that's all he did the whole time he was there. Then they went on to Galveston, and Galveston is on a bay. I was actually at the motel where uh, Ferry stayed at one night. It's it's on a bay. So in other words, uh, it would be a good place if you were going to sail out or speedboat out. To this day, nobody knows what Ferry was doing there for certain. Okay, we don't know. But it's definitely a connection. Now, another one, of course, would be Clay Shaw calling Dean Andrews, which we know is a fact today. All right, Clay Shaw was Bertrand. He called Dean Andrews to go to Dallas to go ahead and defend Oswald. All right. Um, even the FBI knew that Shaw was Bertrand from all the declassified documents we have. Okay. A third connection, of course, would be Guy Bannister's behavior on the day of the assassination and his altercation with Jack Martin, okay, who they both got drunk at some bar. They both wandered back to the office, all right, and Guy Bannister accused Martin of pilfering his file on Oswald. By the way, with the declassified documents we have on this today, this actually really did happen. And it does appear that Martin was taking some of Bannister's files on Oswald because he was very, he made a connection because he knew what was going on there in the summer of 1963. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And so when, when there got to be a kind of back and forth between the two, okay, Martin blurted out something. What are you going to do? You're going to do the same thing to me that you did to Kennedy? And Martin just, ex just got punched. Well, actually, I think, I think Oliver Stone is correct in the film. He actually got pistol whooped. And by, by the way, according to Martin... If Delphine Roberts would not have intervened, he really thought that Bannister was going to kill him. Okay. All right. He, you know, he had to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. All right. Af after this incident. So it's not just the Sylvia Odio incident. Okay. There's these three things that, that I just met and just mentioned. Plus you have to understand one of the things that was used to incriminate Oswald in the public mind was the pictures and films that were made of him in New Orleans when he was practicing what people call his street theater activities. Mm -hmm. Oswald was getting a lot of press attention, you know, and media attention in New Orleans, okay? You know, and so these things, these films and these, uh, the, the taped interview, for example, between him, Bill Stuckey, Ed Butler, and Carlos Springier, those get circulated into the mass media. You know, I talked to a guy in New Orleans who was a reporter there, and he said, Jim, it was amazing how fast it happened. You know, how, st how fast this stuff got circulated into the man. And, and if you remember, as I do, by that evening, there's pictures of Oswald and films of Oswald, okay, on the street in New Orleans with his distributing his pro Castro, you know, and, and, and this was used, of course, to go ahead and brand Oswald as a communist, as pro Moscow, as pro, and as, as Harold says in the interview, you know, there's his investigation you know, look, I can't find anything that connects Oswald to the Soviet Union. I mean, it's true that he defected to the Soviet Union, but once he came back to the United States, I really can't find anything that connects him to the KGB or, or Moscow. And he makes the point, if Oswald was a communist, it's very, very weird 
that all the people he has interactions with, both in New Orleans and in Dallas, are right wingers. You know, they're either anti Castro Cubans, CIA and FBI agents, or in Dallas, members of the white Russian community who wanted to actually overthrow the communist dictatorship there and bring back the czar. Okay. So these are, these are some of the things that, that Harold is going over at this time, which of course uh, are all very interesting and all, and which people have expanded on since he also mentions that he did not think that the combined attack on Garrison that summer of 1967, and he mentions some of it, uh, NBC, CBS, the Associated Press, all in a row, news. This, he did not think that was a coincidence. He thought that literally the press was deliberately ganging up on Jim Garrison, which appears to have been the case. And, and I can tell you right now that CBS, when they were putting together their four hour special, they did one interview with Jim Garrison, except it was by a different person than Mike Wallace. They thought Garrison came off too well in that interview. And then they, they essentially dissolved that interview, threw it down the toilet, and they went ahead and uh, sent Mike Wallace in to do a more confrontational uh, type interview. All right. Um, now, I, I have to say, one of the things that, see, Harold in this interview actually does say that Jim Garrison had a case. Okay. He actually does say that. And he expected him to present a solid case in court. Okay. And he thought that this would keep up the, the drumbeat for a new federal investigation. All right. Which it's interesting that he says that for two reasons. Again, to contrast what he said later. Okay. And also the fact that Harold really at this time in 1968 seems to be a little bit starry eyed and a little bit naive about just how deep the cover up is in the Kennedy assassination, how the Kennedy assassination was really kind of a, what the French word is, a beta noir. It was roughly translated, it means black beast, that, that the state was not going to admit to, all right? And so he actually thinks that Garrison is gonna be allowed to present his case, which he was not. And in, 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 in my books, I detail the subterranean attacks on Garrison's case by both the CIA uh, and the FBI, et cetera. Or, and also some of the media people that were down there like Hugh Ainsworth and, and, and James Phelan. There of course was a later congressional investigation in the seventies, but, and of course, Harold could not have predicted that at the time. But what's so interesting about what happened to that congressional investigation, and it's kind of timely, the first chief counsel of the House Select Committee on Assassinations was a guy named Richard Sprague. Richard Sprague was a very successful uh, prosecutor in Philadelphia at the time. And before he ever got to the House Select Committee, he had developed a very illustrious, almost legendary reputation as being a very, very efficient 
and a very successful prosecutor, sort of like Garrison. Okay, be you know, before 1967 and his Kennedy case was exposed, Garrison was a very successful DA in New Orleans, which of course everybody forgot about once the batteries of the media opened up on him. But the same thing happened to Sprague. Okay, here was this guy who won something like 69 out of 70 uh, homicide cases as the chief assistant in Philadelphia was very well thought of throughout uh, the Eastern seaboard to the point he was appointing special prosecutor in the famous Jacques Yablonsky uh, labor murder case, a case which he eventually won, all right? Convicting Tony Boyle, all right? As the guy who was behind the conspiracy to kill Yablonsky. All right. But then what happens is that once he gets appointed to the House Select Committee, and it looks like he's going to do a real investigation, and he says things like, I, I want to conduct as much of this as possible in public. Okay, we're going to do demonstrations, we're going to do experiments. He's very interested in Mexico City. He's very interested in Silvio Odio. He wants to know why did the Warren Commission not believe Silvia Odio? All right. And if Silvia Odio is telling the truth, then how can Oswald be in both Dallas and Mexico City at around the same time? All right. And those are the things he's invested. In fact, Richard Sprague actually flew down to Mexico City. And he found the CIA translators who did the transcriptions of the audio tapes in both the Cuban and the Soviet consulates because, because the CIA had both of those under surveillance, all right? And he said, I wanna see your typewriter and I wanna bring it back to Washington because I wanna see if your transcripts were altered, okay? Between Mexico City and when they got to the CIA. All right, that's what a kind of prosecutor that Richard Sprague was, okay? All right, except there was a big difference between Garrison on the one hand and Sprague is that Garrison never had the facilities or the money to do the kind of full scale investigation that Richard Sprague was gonna do. You know, Sprague had a budget of literally millions, okay, that he insisted on, all right? And of course, what happened is, it all blows up the same as it did with Garrison because the media starts attacking Sprague. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, Newsweek, they all start running hit pieces on Sprague. And I actually knew a guy who worked for Sprague at that time on the photography panel, Chris Sherratt. And he talks about when the first barrage of stories hit all right, and they went out to dinner and Sprague tried to laugh it off. And Chris Sherrod said, all I thought, Jim, on the way back was this is Jim Garrison all over again. All right, and I have to give Harold credit in the sense that when he saw what was happening to the House Select Committee, he became one of its most vigorous critics, okay? And after Richard Sprague and Bob Tannenbaum and Al Lewis left, okay, he did not like what had happened later. And he criticized a lot of the things that they did. All right. So anyway, that's, that, that's uh, Harold Weisberg and Jim Garrison and a little bit about the uh, possibility of a congressional investigation, which will serve as an introduction to this very interesting interview, I think. This is William O'Connell, and we're talking again about the Kennedy assassination and the Warren Commission report. And my guest today is Harold Weisberg. Mr. Weisberg will be familiar to a number of our listeners who have heard him when he spoke originally on this program in 1966. 
He's the author of a number of books on the case, the first, which is an original work on the Warren Commission report. It's entitled Whitewash, the Report on the Warren Report. And Mr. Weisberg then authored Whitewash II, the FBI Secret Service cover-up. And a more recent book is entitled Photographic Whitewash, Suppressed Kennedy Assassination Photographs. And that is not the subject, however, of our talk today, because Mr. Weisberg has yet another book out cause, called Oswald in New Orleans. Um, and what is the subtitle of that, Mr. Weisberg? Case for Conspiracy <clears throat> with the CIA, I'm sorry. Case for Conspiracy with the CIA. Uh, we're delighted to have you back and with us in the studio again. Thank you. Um, what can you tell us um, about the current investigation being conducted by the District Attorney of New Orleans? In other words, uh, would you give us your evaluation of that inquiry? If you mean by that, do I think that Jim Garrison has a case, my answer is yes. I think if he has nothing but what I have in my book, he has a prima facie case. And I have no doubt that he has much more. Now, I think also I should tell you that I have never said, Jim, what is your case? What do you know? I don't think this is proper of me. I don't think he could properly tell me. Instead, I have sought to help in any way I could. So I can't tell you what his case is. However, in addition to what I have published, I have also spoken to witnesses who were not available to me when I wrote my book. And I do think that Jim Garrison has a case. I think it is a case that justifies the subtitle of my book, Conspiracy with Case for Conspiracy with the CIA. You may remember that going back to my first book, I broadly infer this in Whitewash in Chapter 11, which is called The False Oswald. In the second book, which I had completed and I believe discussed to a degree with your audience last year when yes, I was you out did. here. Yes, you did. Um, I went much farther with the suppressed, and I don't use this word by accident, I mean suppressed the suppressed files on the investigation of the false Oswald. Uh, and here really is the origin of Oswald in New Orleans in these first two chapters because it is my continuing work from these two leads that I had planned to include in, in Whitewash 3, the archive that is Oswald in New Orleans. Now, I, I don't think I can use any soft word in describing the Commission's misrepresentation of Oswald as a person and Oswald in terms of his connections. There is no shred of evidence whatsoever that Oswald was pro-Soviet or had a single pro-Soviet connection. Stop and think of this for a minute because the Commission, as you may remember in the report, refers to Oswald's so-called dedication to communism and Marxism. Uh, this dedication is reflected in, in what the Russians, I think, quite properly regard as slanderous writing. You know, it's possible to be unsympathetic to a political system or to a country without using the kind of language Oswald did. One of his more minor expressions is when he was arrested in an incident that I hope we'll return to on August 9, 1963, in a fake Fair Play for Cuba Committee literature distribution he staged. At that time, he was inter interviewed by Lieutenant Francis Martello of the, Mar of the New Orleans Police Department, and he described Russians as fat, stinking politicians. This is one reflection of pro-Soviet, pro-communist, pro-Marxist dedication uh, that the Commission may see, but I don't. Oswald had no connection that anybody could ever find with anything pro-Castro, except for a self-serving letter he wrote to the National Organization, the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. There is no connection he had any, with, ever had with anybody to the left of center that he didn't originate and that had any meaning. None of these things had any meaning except if you consider Oswald was possibly an agent provocateur. Oswald did have connections with anti-Castro people. Oswald's career is consistent only with that of a man functioning for the CIA. And in Oswald in New Orleans, I trace this back to his Marine Corps career. It's just an unbelievable story. And even now, with all the shocking things I have seen, and mine is a rather extensive study, I find it incredible that there could be such a gross misrepresentation 
of what this man was, what he stood for, and with whom he was connected. Well, from your reading of the volumes, then, you, you see Oswald in contradistinction to what the Warren Commission concludes, uh, rather as a uh, an anti-Soviet uh, a person, uh, a, a person of conservative uh, political orientation, or... Uh, I mean, are you in 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 complete uh, contradiction with with uh, their evaluation of of uh, his political orientation? If he, you, pardon. Is, no, I just wondered. Go ahead. If you please. will eliminate the word conservative, <coughs> I will agree with you. I don't think Oswald was a conservative. I think he was his own kind of a mixed up left winger who really didn't know what he meant and what he thought. One of the keys to Oswald's character is one of Wesley Liebler's unbagging of cats. Mr. Liebler was really very good at unbagging cats. He, he allowed himself to reminisce and to muse when he was examining Nelson Delgado. I have this whole story, by the way, with direct quotations from the testimony, and I think it's very well worth reading. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll summarize it briefly. He was sort of just chatting with Nelson Delgado, the sergeant who was Oswald's Marine Corps colleague, the sergeant who put the communist literature on Oswald, on Oswald's bed. Oswald got this communist literature openly in the Marine Corps. Um, And they were talking about Oswald's interest in reading and what he liked. Now, this was sort of foreign to Delgado, who had other interests, not including reading. They were discussing the book that Delgado described, and he didn't have to describe it to Liebler. Liebler knew what the book was. It was The Animal Farm. And Delgado finally, in the course of this dialogue with Liebler, said, well, is that a communist book? Mr. Liebler said, no, on the contrary, it is an anti-communist classic. And then you can just see the oops springing out of the page when when Mr. Liebler understood what he had done, and he goes on to something else. But I think this is a key. Another key, may I say, is was uh, given to me just a few days before I recorded the program last year when I was on radio in San Francisco, and an anonymous former Marine Corps colleague of Oswald's which is in itself a reflection of the deliberate incompetence of the investigation because the Marine Corps knew, I mean, the commission knew everyone who was in Oswald's outfit. This man called me up. He wanted to remain anonymous because of fear. And he told me that although every man in the outfit had a confidential, which is the second highest security rating, Oswald was one of five who had the very highest. Now, it's unique that you find an outfit in any military service where every man is classified, at least it is unique in terms of World War II experience. It's passing strange that a man getting communist literature in the mail would have any security clearance. The, the, the description of Oswald's security clearance given to me is crypto, and I've, caused, I've conducted my own investigation by speaking to newspaper men who I knew who had their own sources and who could check It turns out that at that time, in order to have a crypto clearance, you had to begin with top secret. Crypto, as a a classification above top secret, added to it for those who have certain cryptographic necessities. Again, what a passing strange thing for a man allegedly communist and a man getting communist literature openly in the mail in the Marine Corps. You think that he was getting communist literature merely as a a blind, as a dodge? No, I don't think it's exactly that. I think it could be. I think he had some interest along this line, but he was not communist, and he was really violently anti-Soviet. I think that uh, if you want to go along it in the line of a blind, I would rather put it that he was trying to inform himself. Uh, But this is not inconsistent with his hatred for the Soviet Union when you consider that he went there and did nothing that is inconsistent if you go over his writing, nothing that is inconsistent with his having been some kind of an agent then. Now, what I, d- what I conclude on Oswald's career in the Marine Corps does not come entirely from this one telephone call because as it was quite early in the morning, I'd been going all day and my mind was fogged, but it recalled to me something I couldn't quite put my finger on from what I had read in the sworn testimony. And after I rested a bit and before I got home, I realized what it was. It was the testimony of Oswald's closest friend who was a radical right man named Kerry Thornley. I went, when I got home, I went over Thornley's testimony very carefully, and I found what didn't interest the Warren Commission, that Thornley testified that Oswald had a secret security clearance, 
and that he spent his last two weeks in the security office, S&C, sort of criminal uh, CID division of his outfit. Now here again is a very unusual thing for a man getting communist literature in the mail. The sworn testimony of Kerry Thornley is a close approximation of the unsolicited information given me by the man who called into a San Francisco radio station. This is not the Oswald we find in the Warren Commission. So going back to his Marine Corps date, and there are other things that bear on this. For example, those who've had military service will know how unique it is for civilians to come to a military establishment, ask to speak to a man on guard, and have the man relieved of guard. Guard duty is a very important function in any military service, and every army regards it with a serious eye. Guard duty is uh, as a as a as a thing that is not varied. Uh, Oswald was relieved from guard duty when these well dressed Ivy League type civilians came. Again, it's consistent only w with his having intelligence connections. Then, I, I find really that this thing builds like a detective story, and it built that way as I was working on it. Um, returning now more to. Um, your own inquiries in New Orleans. Uh, I wonder if first, however, you'd speak of the the thrust of your book, Oswald in New Orleans, and, and tell us something about its thesis, uh, something about the argument and your conclusions in that book. The thesis is, as I've just outlined, that Oswald was not pro-Castro but was anti-Castro that his connections were in no single case with anybody who was pro-Castro and every case that was identifiable with those who were anti-Castro. He further was connected with an organization that was created by the CIA. It wasn't just that, as with so many of these anti-Castro Cuban organizations, it had an association with it. The Cuban Revolutionary Council was organized in Miami March 18, 1961, by the CIA. They, their office in New Orleans was run by Sergio Arcacha Smith and a number of other people. Mr. Arcacha is the man that Governor Conley, himself one of the victims of the assassination, has refused to allow Jim Garrison to extradite to New Orleans. Arcacha was a crook, and they threw him out and uh, other people came, and although the commission would have us believe the organization ceased to exist, it did not. It, it existed at the time of the assassination. Although Mr. Liebler would have us believe that the organization was thrown out of the building in which they were, it was not. They just folded their tents and went away. But they didn't lose their connection there. What uh, the commission, and this of course means Mr. Liebler, who was in charge of that part of the investigation, uh, never told us, and I don't believe that the members of the commission ever knew it, is that a man named Guy Bannister obtained the office space for the Cuban Revolutionary Council and that he continued in his office after they left and all of their mail went to him. Now this assumes point with a number of things, one of which is Oswald's use of this return address as his on some of the literature he turned out. Now, can you picture a pro-Castro Oswald or any pro-Castro soliciting interest by pro-Castro people and d directing them into the something less than tender mercies of the anti-Castro Cubans whose proclivity for violence is rather well known and rather well established, for example, at the United Nations? Uh, now Bannister is not mentioned in the Warren Report. He's one of the many things not. He is misrepresented by the FBI reports in a way that cannot be accidental. Uh, in order to really tell this story, and I think it's a fascinating story, I'd like to go back to the time of the assassination and recall to you that immediately Oswald was a lone and unassisted assassin, connected with nobody. Remember, this was the official story. The police started it, everybody accepted it, the press broadcast it. Strangely enough, on November 25th, three days after the assassination, an FBI agent named Ernest C. Wall, Jr., in New Orleans, conducted a whirlwind investigation of two things, two people, I'm sorry, one person and one thing, Sergio Arcacha Smith, the same man, and the Cuban Revolutionary Council, the same organization. 
It was, an, it was an investigation like few in history. One of these a really exhaustive reports by this man who was bound and determined to get to the root of the, of the cause of the assassination. And this, of course, is what we expect of our government. It's a bare six lines of large type with, white mar with wide margins. A second one, the one that deals with Bannister, is 47 words. In it, Bannister is identified only as of Guy Bannister Associates, whose address is given as 531 Lafayette Street. Says virtually nothing else except to imply that Bannister had a something less than nodding acquaintance with Arcacha, and that Arcacha had a Cuban unknown, a young Cuban unknown to Bannister, frequently in his company. Now, the truth of the matter is that this was a, an FBI exercise in how do you lie with and tell only the truth. This is a monstrous lie. There is no false statement in the report. It is true that Mr. Bannister's address was 531 Lafayette Street, but it is also true that 531 Lafayette Street is identical with 544 Camp Street. It's a very small corner building. All the mail was put in one pot, and those who got it came, in, who wanted it, came and got it. So the Camp Street is address is identical with the Lafayette, and it's identical address. with Bannister's. So if, as Mr. Liebler pretends, the a Cuban Revolutionary Council was thrown out, it's meaningless because they continued to have an association with Bannister to the very end. There was about one inch that separated Bannister's office from the office he rented for the Cuban Revolutionary Council, but the FBI deemed this unworthy uh, of either the consideration of the superiors in the FBI or not really worth worrying the members of the Warren Commission about because they didn't say it. Now, as I said, there was not just a nodding acquaintance between Arcacha and Bannister because Bannister's right-hand man, Jack Martin, arranged for the office space. This is not only true because the Secret Service says it in a report the FBI ignored and the Commission did, but Jack Martin's confirmed it to me personally. This is really not the whole story because not only is it true that the Cuban Revolutionary Council was organized by the CIA, it was to supply the government in exile. It was then to supply the first president of a Cuba if the Bay of Pig, if they, the Bay of Pig succeeded. But I now have in Wesley Liebler's own voice his acknowledgment that they were financed by the CIA, and it does not stop there. Mr. Liebler also acknowledges the connection of David W. Ferry with Arcacha with the address 544 Camp Street, with the Cuban Revolutionary Council. To me, this is a totally shocking thing. And perhaps in some way, Mr. We Mr. Liebler will find an evasion he has in the past, and to a degree they've achieved acceptability. Mr. Liebler, in a speech at the University of California, at Los Angeles, on May 2nd, 1967, when he found it convenient for his purposes to make the students laugh as he discussed this matter with him, said that he alone decided that David William Ferry should not be called as a witness, and he explained it in two ways. First, he didn't consult with the members of the commission. He did it. Second of all, his colleague, Albert Jenner, was too busy running for the Amer presidency of the American Bar Association. So here we have a picture of Wesley J. Liebler, Dutch boy with 10 fingers and dykes with 20 holes in him. Um, and it is true that Mr. Liebler was a very hard-working man. There's just no question about it. I think perhaps he was the hardest-working of all the commission lawyers. The amount of energy he put into what he did is no fair measure of what he turned out. Mr. Liebler knew of David Ferry's connection. Now, in the course of explaining why he did not call Ferry as a witness, Mr. Liebler said, and this is a rather reduced version of what he had earlier said. He began at the time the Garrison investigation became public by saying there was quite a stack of FBI reports and he went through all of them. He simplified it for the students and I don't think it's any reflection of his contempt for their understanding. I think it's a reflection of his recognition of his own needs. He said that there were two FBI reports, investigative reports on Ferry and one affidavit. There is no affidavit. One of the two reports 
was written by David W. Ferry. David W. Ferry, from the very beginning, took over the investigation of David W. Ferry. This, of course, is one way to investigate the murder of the president if you're the FBI, and it's one way of investigating if you're Mr. Liebler. Now, in one of these reports, and I have a chapter in Oswald in New Orleans which comes from this, the chapter title is called Assassination, quotes, a colloquial expression, close quotes. And that's what this report says, that David Ferry said the president ought to be shot. In other words, he threatened to shoot the president. And these daring do nothing's going to stop us FBI agents accepted it as a, a colloquial expression. So did Mr. Liebler. So did all the other people who saw it in the commission and on the FBI. But the net effect of this is to say that when Wesley Liebler knew that the president's murder had been threatened by David Ferry, knew that David Ferry was connected with Arcacha Smith, the Cuban Revolutionary Council, the return address 544 Camp Street, knew that Oswald was connected with 544 Camp Street, knew that Bannister, who also was in on every CIA operation in Latin America, he's a former spectacular FBI agent, a well-known violent racist, perhaps the most violent racist in New Orleans. He knew all of these interlocking things, tying all of these people together and with David Ferry. And he said, because Ferry was connected with nothing, he didn't call him as a witness. This is totally shocking to me. This is only part of the suppression, part of the misrepresentation that I cannot regard as accidental of the story of Oswald in New Orleans. Uh, with reference to Oswald in New Orleans then, uh, looking at him, assuming for a moment uh, your thesis that he was either a CIA operative or or um, counterintelligence, counterespionage, what have you, <clears throat> assuming that is true for a moment, does that then implicate him more closely with uh, the Garrison investigation as part of a plot to assassinate the president? Not as an assassin. You may remember in my first book, I, con I reached a conclusion on this point, and it was dual. First, that the commission had irrefutable proof of a conspiracy. Second, that Oswald was part of it. I at that time said that although I didn't know enough to be absolutely certain, on the basis of what I did know, I was convinced Oswald was a patsy, that he was framed up. Now there is no doubt in my mind, and I don't believe there's any doubt in Jim Garrison's. The, uh, there's one thing I'd like to give you by way of an illustration, however, that I think bears very much on Oswald's real function. <clears throat> you may remember that Oswald left Dallas uh, or Fort Worth and went to New Orleans the end of April 1963. The commission tells us that shortly thereafter, this man who was virtually destitute ordered some fair play for Cuba Committee handbills that the report tells us what is not true. It may be a fact, but it is not justified by the evidence, and the evidence was suppressed in the report, or I should say misrepresented. That under the name of Osborne, Oswald ordered these leaflets to be printed. Now the FBI went to the Jones Printing Company, and from the Jones Printing Company they obtained the artwork for it, the job jacket, and statements from the owner, and the secretary. The owner said he absolutely could not identify Oswald as the man who got it, and of his belief, Oswald was not the man. Now remember, these are the words of the FBI, and in order to really understand these reports, you need a special dictionary because this FBI has a special language. Mrs. Silver, the uh, other official, said that she did not think it was Oswald, but she couldn't be certain. It is on the basis of evidence that it was not Oswald who used the name Osborne, that the Warren report tells us that Oswald used the name Osborne and had this Fair Play for Cuba Committee literature printed. I would like to think that evidence uh, more credible than this is the kind upon which a, a presidential commission bases its basic conclusions. Now what this really tells us is that the best evidence is that someone using the name Osborne, who was not Lee Harvey Oswald, had this literature printed that Oswald, without doubt, did distribute. But here, you see, we have what the Commission did not dare have, somebody actively participating with Oswald, participating, in this case, in the establishment of an intelligence cover. 
Oswald almost immediately used this Fair Play for Cuba Committee fictitious literature that was printed in New Orleans and had no relation with anything. I should say at this point that there never was any Fair Play for Cuba Committee in New Orleans. Now, I have tape recordings of statements by Mr. Liebler saying, of course, we knew very well that Oswald was very active in the New Orleans chapter of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, but this was impossible because it didn't exist and the Commission knew it didn't exist. So Oswald went out and picketed the fleet when it landed in New Orleans, and it didn't get him arrested, and, and he, he laid an egg. Now, this is, the, this is not general. Osborne, but this is the Oswald. real Oswald. So far as I know, it is the real Oswald, but with the thorough incompetence, with the diffidence, the, the indifference to uh, real fact that the Commission handled this, it isn't really possible to be certain. What I will say is that the Commission says it was Oswald, and I'm taking their word for it. He laid an egg. He did this all over again in July, and that time he didn't lay an egg. Uh, that time, as though it had been prearranged, Carlos Brenier appeared with a sign he had for such occasions, a Statue of Liberty in chains, and there ensued a fight. Uh, I don't believe that Brynjir was involved in any kind of a conspiracy with Oswald. As a matter of fact, I don't think anybody would ever trust Brynjir to execute anything. I think there is evidence, however, that this was contrived, because it's remarkable that uh, Brynjir, who was just the right type of person for this, and his associates found Oswald, precipitated a fight, let me tell you what happened when they precipitated this fight. And Oswald was totally innocent. He was standing there peacefully giving out a little leaflet which said, Hands off Cuba. Uh, Brynjir came up and started a tussle with him. And in Brynjir's own words, Oswald crossed his hands in front of him and said, OK, Carlos, hit me. Now, Oswald, you know, was court-martialed in the Marine Corps. One of, them was, one of these court-martials was for the dream offense of every listed man. He poured a drink on his sergeant in the Bluebird Cafe at Yamoto, Japan. Oswald was no sissy. He was no coward. He knew very well that in this instance he was the aggrieved. He stood there with his hands folded, just as Brynjir had described. So they were arrested. Brynjir, who was guilty of disturbing the peace, pleaded innocent. Oswald, who was innocent, pleaded guilty and got a $10 fine. Meanwhile, as soon as Oswald was arrested, he demanded an interview by the FBI. And he was interviewed by John Lester Quigley. I rather imagine Oswald expected somebody else to come, but in any event, Quigley did. And he was, test he was called to testify before the commission. What did Oswald tell you, he was asked. And he said, oh, nothing at all. It was just a self-serving thing. Well, um, how can you explain that? He was asked. He said, well, of course, every, all of these guys do that. Every, all of these left-wingers want to be interviewed by the FBI. I never heard that one before. It's not consistent with anything I ever have heard either. So the commission lawyer then said, well, where are your notes? He said, oh, I burned them. We always burn our notes. This is Mr. Quigley. This is Mr. Quigley. It's not unusual because you know the same thing happened in Dallas with the Oswald expert there, FBI agent Hosty. Uh, he didn't type up his notes of his Oswald investigation until after the assassination. And after the assassination, he burned his handwritten notes. The commission was quite satisfied. But the commission was satisfied with all of these conflagrations because, you may remember, they were quite satisfied for the first draft of the autopsy to have been burned, and they asked no questions about it. This is as normal and natural as breathing when a president is killed. Not when a Bowery bum has a strange death, but only when a president is killed. So... We have this unusual situation of Oswald, innocent and pleading guilty, and this really is only the beginning of a public relations campaign. Before I go into the details of that, I'd like to tell you about a strange document that Lieutenant Martello found in Oswald's wallet, and if we take his word, by inadvertence failed to return to Oswald when Oswald was released after paying a $10 fine. It's a slip of paper that by means of some literary James Bondery, I traced to a source almost every item of this sheet of strange hieroglyphics came from Oswald's pocket notebook. He didn't have that with him when he was arrested. He had the slip of paper transcribing entries. These entries all serve one purpose, to associate Oswald with the Soviet Union in an anti-American and pro-Soviet way. For example, uh, with Lev Setiev, the man for whom he made an anti-Russian, anti-American broadcast. It had his passport numbers, the place where he worked in Minsk, 
the Associated Press and United Press correspondents, who, if asked, would immediately have said, oh, that rascal Oswald, well, he defected. And to be sure that they were contacted properly, if anybody was interested, he even gave their Moscow telephone numbers. This is what Martello got off of Oswald, and this is what you will not find in 10 million words of the Warren Report because nobody was interested in tracing it. Uh, you, excuse me, go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to return just a minute, if I could, to, to New Orleans. Uh, the district attorney of New Orleans, uh, in the earlier part of his investigation, uh, felt that Oswald was involved in a conspiracy uh, with David Ferry and... Uh, um, uh, Clay Shaw, alias Clay Bertrand. Uh, Correct, but not as an assassin. From the very first, Jim Garrison said he had no reason to believe that Oswald killed anybody. He didn't say that initially. I'm, un I'm under the impression he did, that he said Oswald was a conspirator, but not an assassin. Now you what see about what the Garrison testimony of Perry Raymond Russo that Oswald was in attendance at some of these that, meetings? That's correct. That's as a conspirator but not as an assassin. As a matter of fact, Mr. Garrison has in charge the only living person who remains of this group, Clay Shaw, with being an assassin. He has charged him only with being a conspirator. It's a distinction that is usually lost, and that's why I re-emphasize it. He, he said Oswald did not kill anybody, and this also includes Officer Tippett. May I say it also is in my first book. I quite agree with him. Well, do you see any dichotomy here between Oswald uh, being a conspirator and yet not an assassin? Does this... Not a bit. Uh, first, of, there are two ways of addressing it. First of all, and I think that what's involved in New Orleans, as it was in Dallas, is that this was a counterfeit of Oswald. That the man who attended the, the meetings at Ferry's home was not the real Lee Harvey Oswald, but was a man pretending he was Lee Harvey Oswald. You alluded to Perry Russo's testimony before the grand jury and, and that what resulted in the indictment, or what was part of the indictment handed down in New Orleans. It has an exact parallel in the testimony of Mrs. Sylvia Odio, who said that a man represented as Leon Oswald, and that's the name that Russo used, not Lee, but Leon, was brought to her by two CIA types, men who were training, this is what the subsequent investigation showed, not what Mrs. Odio said, men who were engaged in training Cubans in Florida for an invasion of Cuba. And the rest of the story is that they were going to get this man into uh, Cuba. He was going to knock off Castro. And he said Cubans should be ashamed of themselves for having done nothing about Kennedy for what he did to them at the Bay of Pigs, that Kennedy should be assassinated, and it was easy, and he would show them how. So this is only one of many counterfeitings of Oswald. At that time, Oswald was a very unimportant man, and it's hard to believe that anybody, for normal purposes, would want to fake him and, and have a false Oswald. But I think that most of your listeners probably know most of the other incidents. There's no point in repeating them. So uh, to say that um, Oswald was present in a conspiracy is not to say that Lee Harvey Oswald was, because we have this counterfeit who I call the false Oswald. Does that answer your question? Yes, I, I still think that there are that there are problems there, but uh, um, there are many. But I think that the place for them to be washed out is in a court of law. Yes, one wonders if the New Orleans conspiracy, as you characterize it, or as the district attorney has, one wonders then if Oswald was a conspirator uh, in in uh, in New Orleans uh, and not an assassin in Dallas, whether question. the conspiracy in New Orleans then has any relation at all to That's the correct. assassination in Dealey Plaza. That's correct. Let me tell you that there are other known conspiracies to kill the president. I have a chapter in Oswald in New Orleans called Preliminary Postscript from Miami. This is a, an incredible story. On the 9th of November, ten days before President Kennedy was due to address the Inter-American Press Association on the 19th. With the assistance of a police informer, the Miami police tape recorded a vicious right-wing states writer and uh, a detailed explanation of how they were going to kill President Kennedy because of disagreement with his policies. The tape recording was supplied to the Secret Service. 
This was kept secret until after the Miami police knew about Garrison's investigation because the Secret Service said nothing and the Warren Commission sought fit to suppress it. Let me give you one of the more glib means of suppression by the Warren Commission because this too, to me, is shocking. The report tells of a Secret Service study of their file of threats completed November 8th, one day before the tape recording. It talks about the study covering the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Now, the Dallas-Fort Worth area is at most a, a mile drive in a car, but one end of the United States is only five or six hours from the other today. And when this had been delivered to the Secret Service after the study was made prior to the president going to Dallas, it's inconceivable that the Secret Service did nothing about it. Certainly the Miami police did because when the president got there, they permitted no motorcade. And he flew by helicopter to where he made a speech that elicited quite a violent response, also suppressed by the Warren Commission, which instead printed what it knew to be lies. J. Edgar Hoover himself was their authority. There was an invention that achieved some widespread popularity, you may remember at the time, and the commission is indebted to Carlos Brynjir for having given them this. This is consistent with Mr. Brynjir. Um, the, a, a man whose name I remember, remember as Portilla Villa, uh, a Cuban refugee, wrote a fictional account of a non-existing speech by Fidel Castro referring to Oswald's second trip to Cuba and Oswald never went there. What the commission did not do is to tell the people what President Kennedy said on the 19th of November when he was in Miami and what followed it. And what followed it was reported in a Castro speech, a legitimate Castro speech. I got separate copies from the West Coast and the East Coast that are word for word alike, unofficial copies because the government saw fit not to note it. Kennedy told the Cubans, the Cuban press and the Latin American press that the United States government could not impose a government on Cuba, that it was up to the Cuban people to do anything that was to be done to Castro. This is a rough paraphrase. Associ Castro in his speech referred to an Associated Press dispatch from Miami number 254, and I have been unable to get a copy, and I have tried, in which one uh, Carbo said that, following the President's speech, that there would be developments within the next few days which would show the United States the folly of its policy toward Cuba and which would effectuate a change in it. This is a fairly clear threat, and especially in the light of what happened when the president was assassinated three days later with the obvious association through Oswald and other things of Cubans of this stripe. There is, in addition, something I discovered after I had written Oswald in New Orleans. Before it was published, because its publication was delayed. But once I went to New Orleans, I didn't want to change the text of the book, and I added a short prologue and an epilogue to include what had happened to the book to delay its publication and what I had learned briefly in New Orleans. So I didn't include this in the book. But I now have, again through these people I mentioned before who keep coming to me with information and for this I'm indebted, uh, there was a threat made to kill John Kennedy in Dallas the 1st of October 1963 by a spokesman for such a Cuban group before a study group, which fortunately always taped its speakers. And he knew at that time what was not public knowledge, that John Kennedy was coming to Dallas. And he said, for what he has done to us, we will give him what he deserves when he gets here. Now, isn't it strange you won't find this in the Warren Report? If they ask me, I will, I will tell them. Um, I, the, Warren Report, the Warren Commission does not exist, so I can't tell them. But if they ask me, if the federal authorities ask me, I will tell them, as I've told the major magazine, where they can get a copy. And this major magazine does have a copy. They have listened to it, and they confirmed the story to me. I can't afford to do this sort of thing. So you see, there, you're quite right in wondering about conspiracies in the plural, because I know of conspiracies in the plural. Well, the, the reason commission knew of conspiracies yeah. in the plural, and there is a question: Are these or are these not related? Yes. I, I, I think that at this point the proper place for that is before the court of law for which they are scheduled, and I am confident that they will ultimately get there if Mr. Shaw survives. Yeah. 
what are the prospects, Mr. Weisberg, in your opinion, for a new investigation? Are the prospects more or less likely today than they were, say, a year ago? I think they are more likely. There's been a major change in the climate, and I hope that as new books appear under the auspices of the larger publishers, and I think this is a blessing I will never enjoy because of the history of my books, they may benefit from it, and the people may thereby be better informed. This is not to say that all the writing will be what I can certify as accurate, uh, nor is it to say that it will be consistent with what I believe and want people to believe. But again, I think that the people should have, should have access to everything and should make up their own minds. Let me give you some reflections of the change in the climate that I detect. One of the things I attribute it to, by the way, is a rather strange coincidence, if we are going to call this a coincidence, and we've been told that such things as reporters who are writing books dying of karate chops are coincidences that reporters shot in police stations through the heart by a police pistol is a coincidence. So let's believe that when the Associated Press, the Columbia Broadcasting System, and the National Broadcasting Company all in one week launched the most transparent but massive whitewashes and assaults upon Jim Garrison and those of us who've been writing in this field, it will call it a coincidence. Uh, I think it was overdone. And I think the native good sense of the people made them conclude there's got to be something these guys are hiding. I think that is one of the factors. I think also that programs such as this, which are the last remnant of the free press in the United States, um, inform the people and make them think, and that people talk. I think all of these things. And I think also Garrison is achieving a lot of success in the words getting around in New Orleans. I saw a vast difference between April and May and November. There were people standing in line waiting to talk to me in November. And I have to go back to speak to those I couldn't see. And I worked as late as quarter four in the morning. I, I just stop and think of what this means with all the things that have happened to people, with all the strange deaths, all on one side, whether or not they're attributable to any aspect of the assassination. They are all in some way a jeopardy to the commission's story. Nonetheless, people want to talk to me so I can get the story to Jim Garrison because they don't feel comfortable with the fuzz. Let me give you my own experience. I've been probably more systematically and more thoroughly boycotted than anybody else writing. Nonetheless, United Press International asked me to write a piece commemorating the anniversary. And while in the previous three years, I always made it a point to avoid this, simply because I thought that it would just be better for the people to think on that day than to have their thinking directed. I did accept the United Press invitation, and they have distributed that, that article. This is the first time any major element of the press, and in this case it's one of the two largest wire services, has asked one of those who says the government did wrong to give a brief statement of why. I think this is one of the most significant measures of how much the climate has changed. I think there will be a new in the investigation for a number of reasons. You may remember this is the basic conclusion of my first book, that the expected job has not been done and must be entirely in public and preferably by Congress. I say entirely in public so that the press can perform its function. Uh, if there had been non-secret hearings by the Warren Commission, some of the shady stuff that went on could never have been dared. I think it must be done by a body with the, both the disposition and power to punish such things as perjury. This commission tolerated it. I think also that the Garrison trial will make this inevitable, and I'd like to think that my own writing will contribute heavily to this, because it is a thorough documentation of consistent misrepresentation of an official nature and on a federal level. I think also that our future, our national honor, the integrity of our society require a new investigation. You don't feel then that if the Garrison uh, inquiry fails, that is if Garrison uh, is unable to gain a conviction, uh, do you feel that this perhaps uh, uh, might weigh against the possibility of a new investigation by the establishment which is already uh, proclaimed itself as being uh, against such a new investigation? No, I do not. I, don't, I think Garrison has, to a large degree, already succeeded. Uh, 
you know, he's being really considerably suppressed. He made a, a very strong speech in Los Angeles in the middle of November, and it was totally suppressed, totally, except for media in Los Angeles where only one underground newspaper printed it, but radio and television gave it fair coverage. Let me put it to you this way. The problem is for Garrison to get into court. If he presents in court only what I know, only what I have developed on my own independently from of him and what I have in my book, I think he will have presented a prima facie case. The difference will be between a book and a court proceeding. And I think that when this case gets to court, it's going to be a lot more difficult to suppress as the newspapers now suppress the occasional and infrequent speeches he makes. There are things that can cause him to lose his case in court that will not destroy the validity of his information. The campaign against Garrison, I believe, is not accidental, and I think it's not only intended to undermine confidence in him, to corrupt the jurors before they're selected, and to indoctrinate the judges before the, the names of the judges who will sit are known. I think it's intended to make it impossible for there to be a free trial. It's that simple. And this is one of the things I worry about. The other is Mr. Shaw's survival, because if he is not alive, there can be no case. There would have to be an entirely new case against other people. You see my point. Right. So this is how Garrison, by merely getting into court, can win even if the decision in court is against him for such things, as an example, a reverse uh, situation to that which existed in the Shepard case. And you feel then, do you, obviously, that he does, that is, Mr. Garrison, have a link that he will be able to forge between a, a conspiracy, as you've put it, uh, in New Orleans and the assassination uh, event of Dealey Plaza? Yes, I do. We, remember, we must go back to the testimony I <laughs> cited earlier of Mrs. Sylvia Odio, of people who I can trace to New Orleans coming to her and predicting what actually happened. Here you have a link that most people don't stop to think of. Now these people who were taking around a man who was not Oswald, with this I, on, on this I agree with the commission, uh, representing him as Oswald and saying that the president was going to be killed is consistent only with framing Oswald with that murder. It serves no other purpose. Right. We've been talking with Harold Weisberg, the author of Whitewash, the report on the Warren Report, and also the author of his new book, Oswald in New Orleans. And uh, where do you go now from here, Mr. Weisberg, on your journey? Well, from here I return to Frederick, Maryland, where I live. And I want to do a little bit more work on my fifth book, Postmortem, which is written. And I'll have a, I have a lot of other work waiting for me. I expect to return to the West Coast early in the year to fill some speaking engagements. Well, we'll be looking forward to talking with you, hopefully, when you come back again, and perhaps we'll be able to discuss a book that is about to come out or isn't out yet. We'll look forward to that. Thank you very much for the opportunity and for the free air. Thank you. This is Our Hidden History.